Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so we'll get started here. This is the Health and Wellbeing 4 track. And this session will be covering the use of thick client with an HPC cluster, as well as looking at what happens when you make a workflow repository for data mining. So with that, a quick reminder, please wait for the microphone, because we are recording the questions for the session, and we're videotaping. And the first uh, lecture will be by Timur Guria from the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization, CSIRO, and his talk will be Remote Computed Tomography Reconstruction Service on GPU-Equipped Computer Clusters Running on Microsoft HPC Server 2008. Thank you very much. You already covered my first slide. <laughs> um, I uh, have to apologize in advance. Uh, if I start uh, talking weird things, please interrupt me because I seem to be at the peak of my jet lag right now after flying from Australia on Sunday. So uh, not quite thinking straight, but I'll do my best. Uh, so uh, I'll uh, talk about uh, our work on remote CT service uh, that we are doing in uh, Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization with uh, several partners. Uh, some of them are shown on this slide. Uh, and uh, the, the round building on, uh, on, on the right of this slide is the uh, first Australian synchrotron. For those who don't know, the synchrotrons is a, essentially a very large X-ray microscope. It's a multi-million dollar machine, uh, and it's capable of uh, very rapid uh, and intense uh, uh, production of x-rays. Uh, so in the case of computer tomography, for example, uh, it allows these uh, CT scans to be acquired very uh, quickly. Uh, in particular, we are working in collaboration with the imaging and medical beam line at that synchrotron, which is a kind of unique beam line. It's a, it's a large construction, 145 meters long out of the main building with the end station at the end uh, of the beam line, which will be accommodating live humans and animals for medical studies and radiotherapy. And uh, our laboratory is located here in the next building, co-located with Monash University. And uh, we are also partnering in this activity uh, with the MicroCity Laboratory of the Australian National University in Canberra. So, uh, just to uh, give the formal sort of a description. Oh, by the way, it's called the NEED project because it's funded by the National E-Research Architecture Task Force. Uh, so uh, the work is aimed at developing a user-friendly service for remote three-dimensional CT, uh, not just reconstruction, but also modeling visualization, uh, utilizing uh, a relatively large sort of a million dollar type uh, cluster at the Australian Synchrotron, which will uh, contain uh, more than 1,000 uh, CPU cores and also probably a few hundreds of high-end GPUs. Uh, I already mentioned the participants, so I won't repeat them here. And just uh, we are also collaborating with the Monash University uh, Center for E-Research and the Monash University Center for Synchrotron Science in this work. There are three main components uh, to the services that we are developing. Uh, apart from the sort of a core services for rapid CT simulation and reconstruction, uh, there are also associated services for efficient transfer of uh, the data sets to and from the computational facility, uh, and the services for the remote three-dimensional visualization. I should emphasize that one of the main features of this uh, service is that we have to deal with very large data sets. Uh, and it's projected that the data sets will be maybe a couple of terabytes in size uh, per what is essentially one three-dimensional image. So the efficiency of 
uh, not only processing, but the data transfer is critical. Uh, this is a, sort of a high-level overview of the hardware setup uh, that, that will uh, be finalized at the end of this year, the Synchrotron. And uh, there's a um, cluster at, at the center of it, which will be running both Linux and uh, Windows HPC Server 2008. Uh, there's a visualization, dedicated visualization station, uh, which will run probably a Linux or Windows 7 and will be equipped with a uh, few high-end GPUs and lots of RAM. Uh, there is a high-performance uh, network attached storage, uh, which, uh, uh, which is used for uh, uploading and downloading data from the remote user computer over the internet but also to feeding the data to the cluster for processing and to receiving the data from the uh, X-ray detector server, which uh, is a machine connected to the X-ray detector. And uh, the, the, the service is largely controlled uh, by the, by the uh, web, web server components that we developed and that will be uh, running on, on the web server with the Windows Server 2008 uh, OS. Um, this is the uh, um, corresponding high-level uh, high view on the software organization of this service. Um, and uh, it's not a very clean separation between the front end and the back end, but uh, basically the front end are the uh, the components of the services that are directly exposing interface to the user. And the back end, uh, although it may have some components also uh, with the user interface, but mostly uh, interacting with the user uh, through the client, uh, which is, in our case, it's a rich client application running on the user machine. And uh, maybe interesting to mention that essentially it's the same software which serves as a client here. As, and as a multiple worker uh, applications on the cluster nodes. We just compiled it slightly differently, uh, removed uh, the GUI, for example, from the worker, no, uh, w w worker instances uh, of the software, but uh, otherwise uh, the software is very much the same. And the web server uh, hosts uh, uh, IIS, uh, and also on top of it uh, some of the uh, libraries that we have developed for remote submission of cluster jobs, we, um, which interact with the job scheduler on the Microsoft Windows HPC server, uh, and, and the uh, whole uh, framework for uh, user access control, uh, user database, uh, automatic account creation. I'll talk about it a little bit later. But for now, I just wanted to give uh, just a very brief uh, explanation of what uh, computer tomography is about for those who don't know. So the typical CT experiments involves uh, an X-ray source, uh, a sample which is placed on the rotation stage, uh, and the position sensitive detector. And uh, the, the sample is rotated and illuminated by X-rays which go through the sample and then uh, detected by the detector. Uh, at multiple rotational position of the sample, maybe every, every degree or, or a fraction of a degree, a new image is collected. And then this whole lot, lot, lot of data is processed, and it's a relatively non-trivial processing, uh, in order to produce the three-dimensional representation of the internal structure of the sample, which is, uh, on, on the level of physics, is based on the uh, uh, differential absorption of x-rays, depending on the density of the tissue and uh, probably won't go into the details, but uh, to me it's the most interesting part, actually. Um, so, yeah, that's how tomography works, and that's uh, basically what uh, one experience when uh, somebody goes for a CT scan to a medical clinic. Uh, but uh, in our case, it's usually uh, the micro CT where the resolution is typically would be several orders of magnitude, magnitude better than in the typical medical scanner. So we're talking maybe one micron or sub-micron resolution. Uh, and, and the main issue that we are dealing with here, as I already mentioned, because synchrotron is such an intense source of x-rays, 
uh, the speed of data acquisition is tremendous. And uh, the, the, at the first stage, uh, the projected uh, the, the data acquisition uh, time is approximately 17 minutes for 4K cube uh, uh, data uh, with 16-bit pixels. So in order to make the whole process efficient, we need to reconstruct the data in approximately the same time. The current best algorithm, what maybe a little bit obsolete, this data that's well, maybe one year old, but I don't think there were particular breakthroughs during that time. But so it's, it's a good indicator what the best algorithm can do with the data of that size. So it would take 58 hours on a single Xeon CPU. So in order to get time down to 17 minutes, it's easy to calculate that one requires approximately 260 on processes, which is not a problem with that cluster. Uh, but next, we have a much more ambitious goal of uh, real-time three-dimensional uh, X-ray imaging. In that case, the 4K cube data sets will be acquired with uh, ultimately with 20 hertz frequency. So, and, and for, for the appropriate reconstruction, that would require something like 4 million Xeon CPUs. Uh, that's what we are told by the X-ray scientists. I think it's a bit optimistic. They realistically will be uh, either uh, binning uh, and downsizing the data or uh, reducing the frequency. But that's our ultimate goal. And uh, one of the at least partial answers uh, in our case is to use GPUs instead or alongside with CPUs. And this table shows why it is efficient. Uh, several groups, uh, including ours, uh, have been able to show that in the case of computer tomography, uh, the speed up factors with using GPUs are very, uh, very uh, large, can be very large. They depend on the data size, and they actually get larger uh, with the data size. So for example, with for 2,048 cube data volume, we demonstrated the speed up factor of 232 compared to a single uh, single CPU core. And as I said, it gets only better with the increased data size. So GPUs are tremendously efficient in this case, and that's why we are expecting the cluster at the, at the synchrotron to have something like maybe between uh, uh, 264, maybe 512 GPUs attached to the nodes. Uh, a, a, a very important feature of our software uh, design, uh, which is uh, in a sense trivial, but uh, I think it's still rather unique, at least in our field, that we don't expect or require the user to know much or almost anything about the cluster computing, about the multi-process environment, etc. We are aiming at relatively unsophisticated user, and all he or she needs to do in order to direct his farm, his work to the cluster from the local machine is to check the box and say, yeah, I want this uh, job to be executed on the cluster. And uh, everything else is taken care of by our software. And then the real-time feedback is given to the user uh, in the form of a simple progress bar. And the error messages, uh, if any appear on the cluster, they are transmitted back and displayed here in the C client. Uh, for uh, more advanced users, there are certainly some fine-tuning options. Uh, the user can go into preferences, select certain nodes on the cluster, select the distribution of jobs. So we expose some subset of job schedule functionality uh, in our client. Uh, but otherwise, I think uh, our software is very user-friendly in at, le at least this aspect compared to uh, other CT reconstruction packages. Um, and we also uh, make our software available through a dedicated website um, where the user can come and create an account for him or her. Uh, and uh, then subsequently, if we approve the account, uh, the user gets access to the secured area where he has a link to download links to our client application. I should have mentioned is called Extract, and in some cases the same uh, software is called XLI for historical reasons. But there are a number of other applications that we are progressively making available under the same general model. Um, so all of them can be uh, available to the user depending on the 
permissions and everything can be fine-tuned. We have even provisions for subscription charging or paraprescription charges, but we haven't activated that. It's but it's all provisioned in our solution. Um, so just to say what's the current status, it's the software is uh, currently being run more or less 24-7 uh, on three clusters, two at CSRO, including one large cluster with 256 GPUs and 1,024, I think, uh, CPU cores, uh, uh, and a small development cluster, the Synchrotron. Uh, it, it, the software is available for download from our website, tsimaging.net. We had more than 150 test users from a variety of organizations, including places like NASA, for example, or British uh, Museum of uh, Natural History, I think, and, uh, or Lancome in Paris, and uh, many others. Uh, very strange places where people are trying our software. Uh, there are also were some uh, sort of partially successful attempts to commercialize the desktop version of the same software. And uh, here I, I would like to show some examples of what uh, essentially that uh, our software can produce for uh, the end user. And the first image is the movie of the uh, traumatic brain study. It's a mouse brain, about 8 millimeter across, and it shows the internal structure quite cleanly for x-rays. Uh, the sample on the right is the loblolly pine, which also shows, the, in this case, the uh, cellular structure of uh, this particular softwood sample with the rays and, uh, and the vertical column of, ray, uh, of, of cells as well. Uh, here, the, the, the first sample on the left is the uh, material science uh, uh, group uh, created it uh, in, in our division. Uh, it's a metallic microwise and a polymer matrix. Uh, the sample on the right uh, is the self-healing polymer. And it's, again, the work of uh, CSRO scientists. They actually incorporated that self-healing technology now, I believe, in their uh, work uh, with Boeing. So it's incorporated in the uh, top paint of the air, uh, aircraft. Uh, so uh, it's a, uh, qu quite an important work. And then can do this nice visualization using uh, our software. Uh, this is just a part of a leg of a common fly, which, uh, if anything, demonstrates the kind of resolution we are getting with our X-ray machines. As I said, about one micron. Uh, the, the image on the right is the uh, fossil bryozoan, which is, of, as I understand, is of some interest to marine biologists. Uh, uh, I, I just want to show the breadth of applications that exist uh, with this software. It's, it's really uh, what we are aiming at creating is an extension of X-ray microscopes. So people looked at those machines to look at almost absolutely anything from engine, engine blocks uh, to small uh, tissue samples and anything in between. Uh, and the last example here is the actually geological sample uh, of interest to petroleum scientists. And uh, um, it's uh, displayed in such a way that you'll see how the sand uh, fades away and uh, only the oil interfaces uh, are left. So that gives a very nice visual information uh, for, for, for these scientists. And, and the bluish area at the top is actually uh, the air bubble. Um, so what's next? Uh, we are uh, just uh, to say that we have developed this software that enables uh, scientists to do something which hasn't been possible before because we managed to speed up the reconstruction so much. And uh, we are deploying it progressively on uh, multiple clusters, not only in our organization and partner organizations in Australia, but we are planning to install it uh, probably this year or at the beginning of the next year. Uh, in, in uh, Shanghai and maybe later in Singapore or and uh, other synchrotron facilities. Uh, most of them are already using, uh, testing our software. And uh, we're also expanding in the other direction where, we, as I mentioned, we're using our uh, architecture to sort of web enable and cluster enable uh, previously developed desktop applications mainly for image analysis and processing and it seems like it's working quite successfully. So just to recoup uh, what I just said is that uh, we have created a 
a simple design for uh, remote cluster-based execution of uh, software mainly for image analysis and processing. Uh, the system involves these components apart from the cluster. It uh, requires the web server, the FTP server, and the visualization station. And that the applications uh, can be uh, downloaded from the website. And by the way, we control the access to the downloaded application uh, uh, through the, uh, the application talks to the server in real time and uh, only starts at, at the client if the valid account exists on our server. And we, we use that in particular for automatic uh, updates, uh, which is quite convenient. And uh, as I said, we are using this uh, approach to re-engineering multiple other applications for uh, image processing and analysis. Uh, and uh, the results are being used by many researchers in Australia in uni at universities uh, and also at uh, many organizations around the world. Um, thank you. I just also wanted to thank Microsoft for making this presentation possible. Thank you. OK, are there any questions? Um, hi, yeah, from Southampton. We've just got a CT center um, that we're just getting up and running and talking about this afternoon. Um, we currently have are paying lots of money for VG Studio, mm -hmm. which does GPU reconstruction. So I was wondering how your software compares both in terms of um, speed of reconstruction and also uh, sort of functionality. Uh, you said VG Studio. VG Studio. Yeah, um, yeah, I certainly uh, heard about it. I've never used it. So, sorry? It's yeah, the, the software in this area tends to be expensive. Uh, but my impression was that it's mostly for rendering the data. But you're saying it now does the CT reconstruction as well? GPU reconstruction. GPU reconstruction. Okay, that, this, this is something new for me. But as far as I know, uh, at, at least all other applications that I'm aware of that you, you use uh, GPUs for CT reconstruction, they're more or less uh, uh, running at similar speeds, uh, except for some of them which use patented algorithms for uh, rapid radon transform, which is kind of similar to fast Fourier transform uh, as opposed to the normal Fourier transform. So one can get a tremendous speed up by that means. Uh, but otherwise, most applications, and most likely the one you mentioned, uh, will probably give you a sim similar performance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I actually had one. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that the the way you designed the interface was and the system was that the user the end user doesn't need to know anything about the cluster computing. That's right. So I'm I was curious what was what when you made that decision what was the resulting design requirements for that relative to if you weren't going to do that. Uh, very very roughly it's the main requirement was to isolate the user as much as possible from the need to learn anything about the cluster or even its existence. So what uh, the user, at least a, a, a significant subset of users wants, it's a rapid reconstruction, uh, which would be uh, on the user interface level similar to what the user is used to uh, with his desktop uh, environment. So the less the user needs to learn or to know about uh, multi-process, uh, multi-computer environment, uh, the better. That, that, that was the uh, sort of main goal for us. How did that impact um, the back-end development when you made that front-end decision? What did, what did the actual infrastructure need to do? Because I would imagine there's some uh, uh, assumptions that you have to make, right, given that yes. they're not going to be giving you the input. So yes. what did you have to do? Uh, the word I sometimes use in trying to describe our system, that it is kind of industrial system. You know, it's, it's uh, not, uh, it's not uh, designed for frequent uh, sort of tinkering. And uh, it, it, you, you have to trade off something. So you trade off flexibility to some extent. So as I mentioned, I think we only expose, for example, a subset of uh, job scheduler functionality. So if the user wants a particular, particular configuration uh, when submitting his job or her job to the cluster, that may not be immediately available. But if we get 
lots of requests for such particular features, we would certainly incorporate them. But uh, I believe we have, uh, at the moment, have a good uh, sort of a, uh, agreement between the typical user needs and what uh, and the capabilities of our software. And as I said, we do expose uh, s s some uh, flex f flexibility in that uh, cluster submission, but we hide it a little bit on, on the next level. Uh, so one has to go to preferences and uh, uh, play with the parameters over there, if, but it's only optional. Uh, everything will work fine by default, and usually it's sufficient. Okay, do we have any other questions? All right, so we will move on to our last talk before lunch, and that's e -Lyco, delivering data mining to the life science community. That's Simon Zhu from the University of Manchester. Okay, so, um, yeah, I'm Simon Jupp, and I work in the Univ University of Manchester in the Biohealth Informatics Group, and the project's called ELICO, and I'm just going to give really an overview of the project um, today, show sort of what our ambitions are, and try and give an idea about where we are We're about halfway through the project at the moment. Um, so essentially what we're trying to do is uh, generate some infrastructure to support data mining um, and sort of collaborative research in this area. Um, so this is largely composed of the infrastructure that we'll need to um, support these kind of data mining tasks. And then as an, an aside, uh, we want to support the generation of data mining workflows automatically through planning. Um, and then this is a generic platform for data mining, but we want to demonstrate it um, with an application layer, so how we can modify our platform to support a specific use case. And in this project, this use case comes from systems biology. <clears throat> so the project itself is composed of nine partners um, all across Europe and brings in expertise from various different areas. So we have um, our data mining and planning experts from Zurich and um, Geneva. And then from Manchester, we bring in some support for the sort of semantic web aspects and interest that we've got and the grid computing. And then we've got some specialist uh, biology institutes which are helping us with our use cases from um, Athens and in France. So, in general, the problems that we've got, um, if you come into data mining uh, as a non-data miner, then there's a pretty steep learning curve, um, especially with the amount of operators, the algorithms that you're exposed to, and not only knowing what's the right operator to apply to a particular type of data, but then if you're building workflows, what's the best combination of operators um, and all of this is particularly hard, especially for non-data mining experts. So, you know, in our, in our examples, you know, they're, they're biologists who are coming in, they've got data, they want to do analysis, but they often find it hard to um, get involved with the sort of more hardcore end of the data mining tools. So we really want to sort of deliver these um, in some sensible way to the biologists. And actually, secondly, when you're capturing workflows in general, especially these data mining workflows, there's various issues um, involved. Uh, so we have workflow environments for doing data mining. There's some sort of popular tools around, like you know, Clementine, and um, there's the Rapid Miner tool uh, from RapidEye. And all of them support the creation of data mining workflows. And then they have various sort of support for explanation. So once you've cr generated a data mining workflow, um, how can you sort of explain or does it keep the information as to why a particular operator was chosen at this point in the workflow for this type of data? Um, when constructing a workflow, is it possible to detect potential errors in the workflow before execution time? Um, and if you do have errors in the workflow, what mechanisms do the tools offer you for repair? And then having generated a um, working workflow, um, how reproducible is it? So how, can it be shared? Um, and what kind of provenance is kept when the actual workflow is executed? So not just um, all the operators, but actually where was the data that this was used in a particular experiment and trying to capture all this. So these are sort of some of the issues. And in Elico, um, 
<coughs> the main thing is that we're focusing on is developing an intelligent discovery assistant that assists the user in developing the data mining workflow. And this is based on a planner so that you can come in with some input data um, and some data mining goals and the IDA will generate you some potential plans to solve those goals. As well as generating your actual sort of workflow for doing your data mining, we want to explore generating templates from these workflows, so having more generic workflow templates that you can share to solve common problems. <coughs> and the final angle really for the research aspect is how can we improve the ranking of these workflows that the IDA generates? Uh, and we do this through a process that, we, that we've coined called metamining, where we look at deep inside the sort of structure of the workflow um, and look inside the provenance information collected from previous experiments to improve the ranking um, of a particular workflow. And our approach uh, involves using an ontology-based data model for our workflows. Um, so this then gives us a model for having explicit semantics of the workflow. Um, it's based on OWL and RDF based, so we have a representation for sort of publishing and sharing and interoperating these workflows. And these will go into a data mining experiment repository, um, which is um, sort of a semantic web repository for storing the kind of information that's associated with these workflows. So the overall <coughs> workflow for Elico is that you would come into the system with some data um, and you go off to your planner. So we have the EPRO plan planner. And what this does is it attaches some metadata to your data, in which you can also sort of interact and specify at this point. And then you choose some data mining goals, so what you actually want to achieve in this analysis. And then you get your set of ranked workflows generated. And then these, um, these plans are then transformed into some execution language. So then we can go off to tools. Um, primarily, we're focusing on the Taverna workflow bench and the rapid miner tool for actually execution uh, of these generated plans. And then you have two things happening. You have the overall experiment going into some repository. Um, and this repository um, is used for future planning. So the planning learns from previous experiments in this data mining experiments repository. And obviously, then there's the publishing of the actual ex data mining experiment itself. So, um, putting the workflow up on sites like My Experiment, which allow us to share the workflow. And we have the Rapid Analytics, which is our data mining experiments repository. So a little bit more about the planning. <coughs> uh, the planning is based on the hierarchical task network planning. So we, have, um, we define our tasks, um, our data mining tasks, the, the, things that the, possible, the things that we want to achieve in our data mining. And these are achieved by potential goals. Um, so for every task, we have a specification of the input and output um, data types and objects. And then for each of these, we have some associated methods on how you actually achieve that task. And then further methods are composed of sort of simpler task method. So you have the decomposition down there. And then ultimately, you have an operator. So these are the actual data mining algorithms themselves. And we want to describe the conditions and effects of these operators. So under what conditions can I apply this operator to some data? And then what effects this operator has on the data? Um, and sort of very sort of simple example of, of how you would sort of specify something is that you wanted to do some data mining with an evaluation. So this would be your task. And your goal states that you want to do this evaluation via some cross-validation. So you can have a sort of very fairly general uh, description of a data mining goal. So we created the data mining workflow ontology. This is the DMWF. Uh, I'll just quickly go over this. This is the main sort of top level concepts that we have in here. So initially, we have a notion of an I.O. object. So we can talk about data tables and models and reports. And then from these data objects, we want to talk about some metadata, which we can generate from these operators. So this is, if it's a data table, we know we've got attributes like this. there's columns. And these columns might be scalar columns. They might be, have missing values. They might have min, min max values. So we c capture all this metadata about the I.O. object. <coughs> and then we describe the 
data mining operators themselves. So we have quite a rich hierarchy of data mining operators, um, including specific implementations. And these operators are also described in terms of their conditions and effects. Um, and then the second part or area of the ontology is where we is used for the actual planning process where we have notions of goals. So we can um, talk about pattern discovery, predictive modeling, the types of goals, and then the tasks that are used to achieve these goals. So we might have a task that is something simple like to just to dis discretize all the columns in the table. And then we actually have the methods which um, direct you to how you can what uh, operators you can actually use to solve that task. So the ontology itself is based on OWL, like I said, and we use swirl, rule, swirl rules for the descriptions of the operator conditions and effects because we want to do some closed world re reasoning. So when you generate a workflow uh, or a plan, this becomes a sort of instantiation of this ontology. And the sort of ontology approach means that we can actually generate a sort of shared vocabulary for describing these experiments. And it also gives us some abilities to do some inferencing over the workflows that we generate, uh, some consistency checking. And the final point is that we can generate abstractions over these workflows. This is something that we, we want to do that, given a very specific data mining workflow, we can use the structure of the ontology to look for some sort of more higher level patterns and try and extract templates out of these workflows that we're generating. So the ePro plan software, we have three sort of implementations of the planner itself. So the first is just the AI planner, uh, which just does brute force planning. Um, and obviously this generates you, you know, can generate an infinite amount of plans to solve a given task. So we wanted to um, offer some alternate planning strategies um, that will produce you maybe the optimal workflow for a given problem. Uh, and these work in two ways. And one is by having a rich description of the algorithms themselves so that we can um, maybe apply a certain algorithm to a certain type of data and know that this works, uh, that this type of algorithm works well in this scenario. And then there's the case-based planning where we look inside the experiment repository and look at what, had been look at what has been done before in previous workflows. Now, in order to, to facilitate these last two types of planning, we actually have to extend the sort of the generic workflow ontology uh, with this optimization ontology. And we call this the DMOP ontology. And again, we're developing this in sort of collaboration with various data mining groups in Europe uh, to actually describe the various algorithms and the models they generate in, in a much sort of richer way. And this will allow us then to actually really dig into these workflows and find out um, exactly what each component is, is doing. <laughs> so the idea with the MetaMiner is that we can um, improve from previous experience from data mining workflows that have been run um, and extracting patterns from these workflows. Um, and we want to really try and predict the performance of a generated plan. So if you have some plan, uh, can we predict how it's going to perform and then offer maybe a suggestion as, oh, you might want to substitute this operator here because we know that this one works better under these circumstances. So once we've generated our set of plans, um, we move over to execution of these plans. Um, this is really where Manchester have been involved, which is getting support for the data mining tools into um, the Taverna workflow system. So um, RapidMiner, uh, they have this open source um, data mining workflow system. And what we've done is we've exposed all their operators as web services, these SOAP-based web services, which means that we can now bring these into Taverna, which is a more sort of generic workflow system. We currently have over 200 uh, common data miner operators exposed, uh, and these include a lot of the Weka operators, and we're also introducing some text mining operators and some image mining stuff from the group in Amsterdam, uh, in, in Athens, sorry. Uh, and then these plans are converted, so we can convert the plans to, our, to the Scuffle 2 or to T2 flow format 
to load into Taverna 2. And then they can just run as any sort of standard Taverna workflow. And then we want to be capturing, at this stage, the various bits of provenance, which will then feed into our experiments repository. <coughs> so having executed the workflow, we then get to the stage where we want to share the workflow. And my experiment provides us with a platform to actually upload. So now we're getting start to put data mining workflows into my experiment. And Rapid Miner have also developed a plugin for their tool that can expose their own um, represent workflow representation up onto my experiment. One of the things that my experiment doesn't um, support fully at the moment is the uploading of the actual data itself. And so when, whenever we run these data mining workflows, we might generate a lot of intermediate models. Um, and it's not really appropriate to submit all these up to my experiment. So what we do is we submit the workflow up to my experiment as a pack with links out to the data. And the data itself sits in our rapid analytics repository. And then we'll be building a data mining portal, which is essentially a mashup of my experiment using their API and the rapid analytics API to develop, to try and develop a sort of community portal for data miners to come and share actual workflows, data, and um, in fact, holding, whole experiments. <coughs> so everything I've sort of presented so far is a sort of generic application layer for data mining. So we don't have any um, domain specific support. And what we want to do with we have in place is to see if we can tailor the existing ontologies to support a specific domain. And in our case, we're working uh, with some biologists on obstructive nephropathy in the kidney. Um, and they have a whole load of data. So they're having, they've got uh, metab metabolomic data, proteomic data, uh, transcriptomic data, and they've got some image data. And they want to do some sort of large scale data mining over all this. And they can do the individual analysis, but they actually want to get a sort of a view across the different ohms, as it were, um, as to what's actually going on in the kidney um, and, the, and the disease, and to try and identify biomarkers. And what we want to, the stage we want to get to is we've developed this CUP KB, which is a repository of kidney data. And we want to generate complete workflows where we generate, get the data out of the repository, format the data in some way that we can then go off to the Helico and the planner and generate the actual data mining workflow and capture the whole sort of experiment. So not just the data analysis, but also the data gathering part of the experiment and then see if we can demonstrate how we, you know, the full feedback where we generate these new models and these feedback into our CUP knowledge base, um, and then we can sort of initiate further experiments from there. And we've initiated the CUP challenge. So this is one of the things that we're doing for, as part of our evaluation, really, is to go to the data mining community. We've, we've made all the data available, and now we're asking members of the community to um, analyze the data, and then we will can evaluate this against Elico later next year to see how well we can sort of automatically plan some of the solutions that were provided by the community. So some of the sort of research questions that we've got is, how much does the planner actually help? I mean, how many data miners who already work in the field would use a, would use a planner, and at which point does this sort of improve the, their, their working methodology? And can we actually provide sensible rankings through this process of meta-mining? Um, until we build up the la a repository that's large enough, um, we can't really answer this question of how much the meta-mining can really suggest better workflows. Um, and then finally, how much use of this is it to the biologist? So can we get to a stage where a biologist could come with a goal and some data um, and without having a real grasp of the data mining itself, be able to actually execute templates and do the data analysis. Um, uh, and I think this is, will be quite an interesting one for us, is you know, how, how much can the non-domain expert start to use data mining tools in their analysis. So there's the Elico project website where there's more information. We sort of have a demo that's up on YouTube that shows essentially the
basic planning, working on some data and execution of that plan. Uh, we have some plugins for the protege environment for helping you extend the ontology to your own application domain and test it against the planner. Um, but all of the this stuff will, will eventually be hidden behind a, an IDA API which is being developed. So we don't expect users to have to come into Protégé to program um, or to build their workflows. And there's the Rapid Miner plugin for Taverna which we'll be releasing soon. And um, obviously the IDA getting incorporated into the Rapid Miner tool. So all this is sort of happening now. So in summary, uh, we're trying to de deliver some infrastructure to support data mining, and we're using ontologies as a sort of data model um, for designing and planning these workflows. Um, we have the generic platform for data miners, and we're hoping to demonstrate its use in a s specific application domain. So I'd just like to thank some of these people here um, just for helping put the slides together, and uh, I thank you for listening. Okay, oh, I see we have a question. All right, hold on. Um, this was very interesting. Uh, I wonder if uh, you've already tried off, if it's part of your research to uh, use planners to create workflows, or has it already been done in your group? Um, so, yes, we use the, the planner that we develop generates these workflows. <coughs> but um, from what I understand, these are workflows that are going to mine uh, for uh, workflows of interest. Is that right? Or did no, I no they, they're actual complete, sorry, they're, 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 they're actual complete data mining workflows. They're not... They yeah, but, but, but uh, okay. But a data mining workflow for me is some sort of workflow that's going to mine a workflow base looking for workflows of interest to answer a given uh, user demand. That, that's what I thought a, a workflow mining was. Uh, whereas using a planner to construct a workflow, uh, in, as, as a user will go and say, I want to sequence this and that, and create, use a, use a planner to construct a workflow to suit my goals. Mm -hmm. that, so that is the difference in, in my head. Are, are they the same in your project? No, so in Elico, we, we use the planner to actually create the workflow that does the data mining. Uh, if that's not clear. Okay, hold on. Um, okay. So why did you use SWRL rather than rule ML or some other rule system? Um, for the specific choice of rule, so the swill rules are part of which we can incorporate into OWL. Um, and I don't know why there was a specific choice by Zurich over any of the other rule languages for specify. I mean, the rules themselves, I don't think, are particularly complicated. So I don't know if there was um, if there's any performance issues or probably some platform issues. With your platform, do you also provide a toolkit for data mining algorithms, such as uh, trend detection, outlier detection, whatsoever, clustering, and so on? Do you have a toolkit uh, of algorithms to choose from? Yes, yeah, so the, the algorithms you, that are... You didn't mention that, that's why I'm asking. Yeah, so the algorithms that are available in like a tool like, like the, the Wecker algorithm, with rooms or the ones that are in Rapid Miner, um, it's not essentially a toolkit, but we, we they're all exposed as a web service now. But it's I wouldn't say it's, it's much of a toolkit. But then with the integration into Taverna, you sort of you have them on hand, um, and this is one of the, yeah this is one of the first things that we've got really is to bring them into Taverna so that you can actually just drop them in your workflow. Yeah, but they're wrapped around however Rapid Miner um, deliver them. 
my other question is, you said you were using OWL. Mm -hmm. Which fragment of, which flavor of OWL? Are you using OWL DL, OWL full? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, this is a bit of a problem. So we, we have, the ontology is OWL DL, um, but we want to do some closed world reasoning. We've got some rules in there that actually take the ontology into OWL full. So we have um, the sort of the domain component of the ontology we keep as an LDL ontology. Then we have an extension that does actually take it out of um, LDL to do some of the querying that we need to do. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the expressivity of the ontology is. Um, I had one qu last question. Um, what has the user feedback been with the, the consortium of universities you've been working with? So the only real users that have been exposed so far has been through the rapid miner tool. Um, we haven't had many users on the Taverna side. Um, and it, it has been used. I mean, I think that's about as far as we know so far, um, spe especially for the um, support for choosing which operator comes next. So as well as planning the complete workflows, you can actually just be at a, a single point in the workflow and ask what comes next, and this is functionality that came out of Elico that's now in Rapid Miner being used, and some of the error detection in the workflows and repair functionality. So it's sort of, it's sneaked into Rapid Miner and it's sort of hidden from the user that it's uh, coming from Elico. So. Okay, um, so it is 12.15. I'm sure you are all hungry for lunch. So um, with that, we'll conclude the session. Thank you very much.